that summer was going to be a big dry year. The year before it was dry, 2006. And then um, our fire management officer at the time, I always remember this, he said, I just turned my sprinklers on in April. That's not usual. When the lightning struck hit, um, I got a call from uh, Kurt Nelson for the Forest Service. He said, hey Randy, we've got this issue, it's kind of brewing, I want to make you aware of it. We're not quite sure what's going to happen yet, but a couple of weather events, you know, could really spark this thing up. Jean sat down with us and she said, you know, look, I got, you know, they bring in meteorologists, you know, part of this incident command team. And there's two of them and then they do, they do independent models and fire behavior. You know, our one meteorologist says that without intervention, you know, fire is going to burn over Ketchum and that, you know, we put in about the 95, 98 percentile, you know, likelihood. And then I go, okay, well, what's the second one? And they, the second one came in at 99 percent. Of course, a couple of days later, it obviously, it had blown up. It had gone beyond the capabilities of the hotshot team that they first dropped on the fire to manage it. And, uh, you know, the next, pretty much the next month was, it was a rodeo. And I remember talking to was, you know, Crapo and, and uh, our good friend Larry Craig and Mike Simpson's offices, and they're just basically, were all very helpful. I said, Randy, what do you need? You know, Randy, what do you need? And I just said, we need help. We don't have enough resources. Larry Craig, who was actually in good standing at that point with the administration, uh, went straight up to the White House and got their fire reclassified to the number one highest priority in the country. And then within 24 hours, we saw about a thousand more people. I think there was about 18 air resources air showed up. And all of a sudden, you know, we're now set up and in good position to battle this fire because it was moving quickly on two flanks and we needed to manage that because it was coming around us on the north and it was coming up through uh, towards Baldy. I was actually in charge of that engine and kind of in charge of about four other engines or under me when without a whole lot of fanfare they started lighting off basically both sides of Warm Springs Canyon from it wasn't quite from Penny Lake but I mean it was all the way out to the Frenchman's Hot Springs and it was basically taking their opportunity to clear this fuel and create a break for the, certainly for the Castle Rock fire, but they had a vision of, they had the political will, get some of this fuel reduced and removed for the next thing that happens. And that certainly looked pretty prescient when Beaver Creek ran up. I mean, Beaver Creek ran up against a lot of the Castle Rock burn and stopped in those places because they'd gotten rid of so much of that fuel. Due to some incredible uh, work for the Sun Valley Company, they brought in their own fire, um, their own fire resources to manage the mound because obviously they had a lot at stake, and they were able to fake the snow making machines, uh, the snow makers out, and actually blow water. At the end of the day, a lot of decisions by a lot of really smart, talented people were made you know, that kept the Castle Rock fire from burning into town and from really creating, and there were really no injuries, um, no loss of life, no loss of any of our homes, and it was based on this incredible teamwork that we had. The summer of 2013 was very active fire year for the entire state of Idaho. There were 14 major fires burning around the state. Out North Fork of Deer Creek, um, flagging along the road, the areas we were gonna thin. And um, so, so we were busy getting ready for, to, to plan for some thinning. Deer Creek fire started the next day. A few days after that, it was in the Deer Creek watershed, or the drainage there. Um, and then a week or so later, it blew out. Castle Rock was pretty slow moving fire. Beaver Creek moved a lot faster. It was a lot drier. It was in a lot lighter fuels. I mean, we saw fire behavior at three or four in the morning that I wouldn't have expected to see at three in the afternoon, which is kind of your prime burning time. You know, three or four in the morning should be pretty quiet. And we watched some things burn up Deer Creek a couple of days before this evacuation that 
three in the morning, I was like, hmm, that's definitely not what I'm used to seeing. That fire did have days where it moved fast and was doing things I didn't think it was gonna do. The way it came out of Deer Creek, the way it came out of Greenhorn Gulch, um, you know, it was really trying to uh, cross Highway 75 and keep on going. Uh, Beaver Creek Fire became the number one priority in the nation for uh, firefighting. And so there was a tremendous amount of resources rallied to come protect Sun Valley, Ketchum, Haley. One of those calls that we got, we got paged out for it, um, for, for fire right behind the animal shelter. And in theory, this is part of the whole Beaver Creek fire. This should be handled by the type one team. I actually for once had some radio contact with some people on the type one team because one of our members was being a, a training as a division supervisor. So he had one of our radios as well as one of their radios. He said, no, we'll take care of this. About 10 minutes later, he called me back and said, you know what, this isn't, we're not gonna be there anytime soon. You guys need to go out and try to deal with this. And it came, you know, it came down carbonate really fast. Um, really hot. There's a crew that showed up just before we were basically going to write off the animal shelter. They'd evacuated it. Um, there was no, there were no animals there. There was a giant propane tank. Um, there's no there's no constant water supply there. There's no hydrant or anything like that. And it just didn't look like something we were going to be able to safely do. So we were kind of in the process of moving out of there when the people from the type one team finally started showing up. They did a burn operation around the back, which isn't something we ever do, so we're not really trained for that. Um, and they actually managed to create enough of a fuel break to protect that. And we spent another couple of hours in that area trying to keep it from jumping south uh, over the Croy Creek Road, because then it would have gotten into all of those um, cultivated fields there and could have gone then up Della and it could have just kept heading south. Most critical decisions at that point that we could do were, you know, developing the trigger points by which we were going to evacuate our neighborhoods and how we were going to manage that. And it meant that, you know, a trigger point, if the fire got to here, we were going to do this. If the fire got to here, we were going to do that. And shortly it was all really kind of ridiculous thinking about because the fire just burned up, you know, Warm Springs and we ended up pulling the trigger and having to evacuate all of Warm Springs. We evacuated Greenhorn Gulch, we evacuated eventually East Fork and, uh, you know, I think at one point we ended up evacuating somewhere between three and 4,000 people. Well, for the elderly residents, the respiratory problems from smoke is a, was a really big issue. And hotels filled up in Twin Falls. I have relatives who went to Twin Falls because they just couldn't handle the smoke. Red Cross shelter, and I think the first night we only had like and these could be wrong, three or four people, maybe 10 people show up. And what happened is the rest of our community opened their doors and absorbed these evacuees into their homes. And, and a lot of times they didn't even know who they were. Quite a few people who did not evacuate out Warm Springs. And it was interesting, you know, there was sort of some it's a little underground rail railroad, you know, people with bikes would be biking into town and getting supplies and everybody was, you know, they'd come out and chat with us and they're all very friendly and happy to see us all there sort of camped out in their driveway. The, uh, the area during the Castle Rock fire in uh, Adams Gulch, we heard stories of uh, vast fortunes in artwork being taken out in trailers because, of course, you know, these fabulous homes in Sun Valley and north of Ketchum, uh, you know, the, they didn't just have trinkets lying around the house. When they left their house, they sometimes left with trailers. Okay, you need to be on alert. So we were on alert, so we had packed up our cars with everything that we thought that we needed. And it was a good exercise because you realize that you really don't need that much. Um, and then we saw on the TV that there was a mandatory evacuation. So as we were kind of putting everything into our car, I mean, we looked up at the hill and you could actually see the flames encroaching. Um, and it wasn't like really close, but it was close enough that it was 
definitely added some panic. <laughs> um, and then we, my dad w is working for Sun Valley, and so he was working for Sun Valley at that time. And they were providing free um, accommodations for people who had been evacuated. So we actually were going up to Sun Valley, but there was a huge line of cars going out of town. Um, and it was pretty much at a standstill. And um, I had some friends that had been evacuated as well. And it, again, you also realize that we're in a valley and there, the escape routes are pretty minimal. So I, we had some people go through Stanley and then I actually had some people that went over um, Trail Creek and got a flat tire and it was like a whole ordeal. And so we gathered up our pets. We gathered up our few belongings, very little uh, computer so I could work. And we took off into Old Haley, deep into Old Haley, and stayed with my sister. There were three families in this big house with our pets. And um, it, was, it was exciting. I had to leave in the middle of the night when somebody banged on our door and said, Haley is on fire. And I said, what? Because we'd been told the fire was miles away from town, still over the hill. But during the night, it had been pushed up Croy Canyon and was right on the crest of uh, the city of Haley. We did have three friends and their dog who were who had evacuated to stay with us. So one had come down from West Ketchum, not under a mandatory evacuation, but she just wanted to get out of West Ketchum, and then one, two, and their dog from Deer Creek. So they were staying with us, so they all packed up again and decamped to Bellevue, to friends of ours who live, or a friend of ours who lives right at the mouth of Muldoon. We figured that was a pretty safe place. And uh, by the time we got the don't, you don't need to evacuate notice, it was about nine at night. Um, there were now four or five of them down at our friend's house. They're kind of having a good Friday night. Nobody really felt like packing up and moving back in. So they just stayed down there and that seemed fine. And that was actually the night that it came burning over the top of Carbonet, um, burned all the way down to Croy Creek Road, actually jumped south of Croy Creek Road in one or two places. Uh, they did again put an evacuation order out at about four in the morning and I was pretty happy that those guys weren't there. So I think 1,600 homes were evacuated in the Wood River Valley, um, including the Idaho Mound Express, which our office downtown Ketchum, a sizable office with m many staff and quite an infrastructure in a brick building, it just got up and moved. And that was servers, printers, computer terminals, desks. And we set up shop in a barn at Quigley Farm. It was hot, humidity was down, the winds came up, we lost all air resources. And I remember standing out in front of the city hall and the fire with the winds was spotting about two, you know, one and a half to two and a half miles ahead of the, you know, the actual flames. And, and uh, I was standing there at City Hall and I was watching the spot fires, you know, on Rock Garden, you know, on some of the mountain and people uh, standing there at City Hall because remember it was very ominous, it was very dark gray ash was flying you really didn't have much visibility it stunk it was hard to breathe and there was kind of a pall over the whole community and uh, i remember in you know people just standing there at atkinson's you know those are the people who we didn't evacuate but that um were in tears and we were just watching you know we thought at the time our our livelihood going up in smoke fire embers were falling like uh not just embers and little ash, but entire twigs and sticks, you know, because the fire was so hot. The entire forest was going up in the air and coming down. On, you really had to look out for this stuff. And the great fear was that this fire line of 10 miles along the Woodrow Valley that night was just going to sweep right into the valley floor and start taking out whole neighborhoods. And it seemed very possible. And even with so many people and so many aircraft and so many engines, you see this wall of fire and you think, what could really stop that? You know, fortunately, the wind died down and they were able to handle certain very intense areas. I mean, it looked like three quarters of Haley was awake and they were all wandering around the streets because of course, big glow from carbonate. I mean, everybody describes it. I never saw it because we were out there, but I mean, the way it apparently rolled over the top of carbonate and came burning down the hills. 
the city of Haley above Carbonate Mountain. I get down to, this, to the door and I open the door and I look out in the middle of the night, it's three o'clock in the morning, and all I see is a red blaze that looks like it's right in town. It looks like the worst has happened, that the entire city is on fire. And it's hundreds of feet tall. And I think, what the hell is going on? So everyone else is jumping in cars and ready to drive for it. And I ride my bike down there because I see policemen on Main Street you know, standing there with their hands in their pockets and people in their bathrobes. And I said, what's going on? And I told him I was press. I showed him a card. I went through the fire line. They said, don't mess around back there. Come back quickly. And I went down to the Bigwood River and there were firemen setting off uh, fire canisters that were sort of grenade, incendiary grenade. And they were shooting these up onto Carbonate Mountain. And they would explode and it created this huge wall of fire, really hundreds of feet tall, that swept up the mountain. It was a controlled burn, but we didn't know that living in Haley, so everybody was completely freaked out. Ten miles of the west side of the Wood River Valley was on fire, not far from the cities. You could see this glow at dusk. And I would ride my bike down along with hundreds of other people who were on the bike path. There was kind of disaster tourism at its finest. You could ride your bike down the bike path and see the sky glow red, trees bursting into flames at some points, uh, helicopters sucking up the water out of a pond at the golf course and jetting over there, dousing, putting out trees, and returning back, just flying these sorties, you know, hour after hour. It seemed uh, miraculous to me that this entire wall of fire that had been burning for two weeks, consuming hundreds of thousands of acres, was stopped at Highway 75. I think it was a heroic effort by the, on the part of these uh, firefighters. We got a type one, you know, that got high enough on the level of concern that they sent. You know, their crack teams is like 70 people show up and they all have these specific jobs that they do. And uh, that's when we first meet, met Gene Pinchatoli, you know, who, you know, really saved our community at that point. But uh, she comes in with this team of 70. Sun Valley Company was gracious enough to let us use the River Run as our uh, lodge, as our headquarters. You know, and I got a chance finally uh, to go up and to thank, you know, these at this point, I think there were somewhere around 1,400 people, you know, fighting this fire, risking their lives, you know, to protect our way of life. And just standing up on that stage with Gene and, you know, a few other people and just saying, hey, you know, you guys do this for a living. You go from community to community, and I would hope that I can stand here and try to, you know, push on you just how we feel about our quality of life, how much we love this area, and the fact that we get to continue to have our lifestyle, raise our family and our kids here as a result of the effort that you put in. The incident command post was an entire portable city that just cropped up overnight, uh, 500 tents, there were, uh, there were there were trailers with showers and latrines. There were catering vehicles. There was a uh, an office that printed a newspaper every day. I got really excited during the fire because it was a time for me to um, go behind the lines, to interview people, to see what these firefighters deal with. It was incredibly exciting for me. It was uh, this covering the incident command post on Buttercup Road was, uh, it was a scene right out of Apocalypse Now. There were hundreds, hundreds of men and women camped at this uh, incident command post. There were 88 fire engines. There were aircraft flying overhead, dousing trees that were bursting into flames a few miles away. There were large cargo planes flying in and dropping these swaths of fire retardant. And uh, hotshot crews, these guys were incredible. They, they would be like 10 or 15 of them in a group, mostly men, but I understand there were some women hotshots too. And these guys had 50 pound packs. They had, they'd carry a chainsaw and enough food to last three days and they would hike out into this very steep terrain 
They were sawing down trees that were on fire, dragging them back into the burned areas and trying to create fire breaks along the way. The amount of information that was available at that time, I felt like it really like ramped up uh, the Idaho Mountain Express, for example, and um, that's how people like that's how I you know we were getting our day to day information was from news sources, and so realizing how important those institutions are in you know communicating during a time that feels really chaotic and you don't know what's going on, but being able to kind of turn to you know uh, someone and know what's happening and what you should do spread right up into Baldy, the ski resort mountain. And uh, I believe uh, the newspaper ran a headline, Baldy is on fire, Baldy's in a blaze. And uh, the Sun Valley Resort, I heard, had a little issue with that headline because, you know, this is an internationally known uh, destination resort. How can we be reporting to the world that it's on fire? Well, in fact, if you look at the photographs and you look at the the history of the fire and where it burned, the mountain was on fire. And that day it looked like a volcano. It was absolutely burning higher and higher. And, you know, it might have been desperate news reporting. I think it was accurate. And I think that when the news is reported accurately and it does show the extent of danger, I think that contributes to more contribution of resources, you know, state and federal level. So. You know, we take our job seriously in reporting the facts. There's a lot of rumors going on. You don't know whether the city of Haley's up in blaze or if they're doing a back burn. 42 separate fire agencies throughout the entire state of Idaho, you know, came to our rescue. And, uh, and so we had to manage the structure protection. And I know everybody knows this, but we have some, some members in our community who are very influential, you know, who were pretty adamant that whatever resources we had that we used to protect their piece of our pie. We were in the national news for a week or two as the number one fire in the nation. And uh, what was interesting is when you get in the USA Today newspaper or on NBC or ABC News, the lead is always uh, homes threatened belonging to Arnold Schwarzenegger and Tom Hanks and others. So, you know, maybe luckily we have some movie stars around here. They kind of, you know, up the ante a little bit. But there were hundreds and hundreds of families, uh, rank and file, all over Blaine County who were um, really thinking they might not have a home to come home to. There were a lot of larger national news stories that were coming out of here, so there were bigger anchors, um, but that definitely gave more of a skewed perspective on what was going on. So, you know, they really focused on uh, the celebrity houses that were here and that were, you know, potentially in danger. I was only one of many reporters and photographers and uh, editors and administrators and production people and uh, publishers who were working on this fire. Um, we were a large team working on the fire out of a barn in Haley and uh, I'm very proud to be a part of that team because we we didn't close down, we didn't shut down. Fire behavior, it's really important to know when you're fighting a fire that, you know, there's a, what they call a burn period. And that burn period, depending on humidity, heat, and wind, could be anywhere from two to six or two to seven or eight. And that's a time where the fire is really um, unpredictable and unmanageable. Because typically during those times, the wind comes up and then you lose your air resources. And you basically have to then go with your ground crews, but then they have to be extra careful because you know the be fire behavior is so erratic you know there's safety concerns and there's a big issue now of uh, whether or not to continue to fight these fires and to continue to leave these old growth uh, deadfall areas f packed with fuel for these mega blazes that happen occasionally and we've seen several of them around here in the last 20 years very very big hot fires that people could hardly go near 
uh, or to um, perhaps let them burn, you know, and in many, many cases, I think that's the only option. You know, I heard that a lot of during this talk, during these talks at the incident command that, you know, this area is burning, it's in deep timber, it's moving this way, we're going to keep an eye on it, we can't really do much about it. Whereas over here, we might take this opportunity to build a fire line, dig trench and protect an area while we can, send the hot shots in, get them out apparently when, you know, things really start going badly. Required us to do what they call back burning. And essentially what that does is it takes the, the fuel component out of the equation. So what happened is it started and there were a lot of people who didn't like it. A lot of concerned people in Hewlin Meadows and along the uh, Warm Springs, the north end of the Warm Springs Road, um, you know, who were adamant against backburning, but I'm convinced that due to the backburning and those of us who were listening to, you know, the, the information, um, we knew that we needed to do that. So they started to backburn. And then that saved the community on the one side. I think when people come to Idaho and spend time in the mountains and in the forests around here, they may not understand that fire is a natural phenomenon that, of course, has been clearing the land here for eons and eons. And um, so it's a natural part of the West. Fire is a necessary thing, and it's actually a really good thing for the environment. There are plants and animals that rely on fires. Um, and he was talking about if, you know, if there were the social constraints or political, um, you know, boundaries, there's a lot of the fire that should probably burn because there's a lot of mistletoe um, and the forests aren't as healthy as they should be. So it'd actually be a good thing to let the fire kind of burn a lot of that area. But again, just because of like human values and you know, we restrict a lot of that. Um, and I think with climate change and hotter temperatures and less water, um, fire is going to become something that's, that we really have to, um, you know, deal with as well. You know, the researchers are saying, you know, we're only going to, uh, it's going to be hotter, warmer, drier, windier. Fires are coming, they're going to be big in our foreseeable future. Um, the tools we have, I don't think we've been able to use as much as far as like prescribed fire. Um, society's attitude needs to change a little bit and we probably need to help with that education and changing of, of the attitude with prescribed fire and um, the risks. Um, yes, there's going to be smoke, but two or three days of a nuisance smoke from prescribed fire is much less than weeks and months from these larger fires. When people come to the valley, they see our pristine nature and they see all the things that we're famous for. They go up hike to alpine lakes and such. Well, they're also going to hike through burned areas. And that's when you can really see the fury of nature in this area. You can actually see the different ecosystems. So you can see um, an ecosystem that hasn't been affected by fire yet and then look at the similarities and differences to one that, that has been. Um, and it's really just getting people out and ex like having a real experience with that. So you can read it and you can see it in pictures and you can see it on film. And it's just so different than actually having that, um, that experience. Um, and I think there are a lot of other, you know, I think we think it's just like fire. So, it's, so you go on a you know, fire ecology walk and you're learning about fire and how that affects the ecosystem just kind of by what it looks like. But I think, you know, with the flooding this year, a lot of people have been talking about how it's, that the river is acting so differently now than it was in 2006. And I think that definitely, you know, fire changes ecosystems and erosion rates. And um, so it's really more of like a holistic, looking at something more holistically than just, you know, oh, the fire impacted, you know, our community in this one way. And it's like, well, actually, you know, it has a lot of uh, different consequences. And so kind of exploring, exploring that. And the ERC works a lot with um, noxious weeds and invasive plants and fire uh, definitely kind of encourages um, those plants to come up as well. So it's a whole, there, with fire comes a lot of different ecological consequences. But I believe it was the fall, right after the fire, um, big rains came, of course, 
and the grass was gone, the sage was gone, the trees were gone, and this grainy soil just gave loose, especially in the area of Golden Eagle, and started coming down in huge landslides surrounding houses in mud and silt and sand because there's nothing holding the soil back. And um, it really did alter the landscape in a profound way. In that time, in the last 10 years, it definitely feels like weather patterns are becoming a lot more unpredictable and severe. And so with the fires, that definitely like creates um, just being kind of a little bit more unsettled and a little bit more nervous about what could potentially happen, but also being in awe that, um, you know, humans try so hard to control um, nature and the environment and make it really safe. But I just, you know, I think that these big, um, you know, natural weather occurrences really kind of humble you. Most of the area that the fire has burned that I've traveled in has come back in a very big way. There are grasses, the sage won't come back, the trees won't come back for many, many years. But so many of these hills are absolutely green after being reduced to complete moonscape. So it's remarkable how nature uh, recovers from this. It's only going to become more and more prevalent. And the big thing that what we really are focused on in most of these departments like this valley is what they call the urban interface. Places that are at risk are out in the wildland urban interface. So it's not true or it's not true wildland, it's not true city or town. It's just this kind of in between. And more and more people are liking to move there. I mean, you look at these places that we were defending out. Greenhorn or Out Croy, I mean, they're all houses I'd love to live in. I mean, they've got great views, they're very secluded, they're very private, um, and they're going to continue to be in danger. These fires are going to start. There's no preventing that. Um, fuel reduction can help keeping them from spread in the timber areas. You know, I like to hear that they are doing some fuel reduction around, I mean, Stanley area terrifies me, all the beetle blight up there and all the recreational op opportunities that are up there. And uh, as far as protecting structures though, it's really up to the homeowners to make, I mean, we'll try to help and we'll give them advice. And um, sometimes there are grants available to actually pay people to come and do the work for you. But as far as protecting your, your home, it's, it's on you and it should be, you know, it needs to be done before you see smoke boiling over the ridge for sure. Because um, they're just gonna, you know, more and more people are moving into the interface. I mean, we don't even have it that that bad here, compared to you know Colorado Springs or Boulder or these places that are just spreading out up into the mountains. And then that's where they say, you know, oh, fire today is 700 acres, and the next day they say, well, fire today is 30,000 acres, and we've lost 200 homes. You're like, oh my god. I mean, we still kicking you know, feeling bad about the home we lost out Greenhorn and these guys will lose whole subdivisions because they just can't, they just can't be controlled. They should appreciate the kind of drama that takes place and the kind of danger that sometimes we live under here in the West. We have this beautiful, wild, natural environment, but we also live in a tiny sliver along the Big Wood River that is inhabited by human beings and we are surrounded by vast uh, uncontrollable natural forces, whether it's avalanches, floods, wildfires, you name it. Um, that's why we live here, but we also have to face the dangers too. We try to push this point year after year when there aren't fires about being fire wise and creating a defensible space around your house. It also poses tremendous risk and danger to people who are living within these uh, wildland fire zones where they have to take certain precautions, you know. They have to clear uh, trees from around their property. We recently passed laws prohibiting cedar shingles on rooftops. Uh, There's certain things you have to be aware of during fire season. I think it's really scary and provides a lot, a lot of anxiety. I mean, especially growing up in the area, I think it's hard for anyone when there's like major changes that happen um, and when your livelihood is actually, you know, at stake or, or we, my parents still live in our childhood home. And so the idea of that potentially burning and not being there is definitely, um, you know, a scary emotion. I need to be doing some mechanical thinning 
Uh, we can't do it everywhere, and some people don't want us to do anything, but just being able to do some thinning around homes and, and the communities and stuff, is, it's, it's those tools that we need to be using. But we've also recognized that uh, bark beetles and bugs is part of the natural ecosystem, and, and what has happened up there with such a large amount of the pine beetles is probably a natural event too that maybe occurs every hundred years or so. I think on average lodgepole pines, um, their lifespan is about 80 years. So it just happened, you know, the last 10, 15 years it hit that, that span and instead of having fire we had the mountain pine beetle come through and, and, um, and do its thing. So now we're dealing with the aftermath of it um, and because of where we build our homes and have our communities and stuff and, 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 and fire suppression because we have been putting a lot of fires out um, instead of letting, allowing fire um, to burn as maybe it needs to in some areas, we're suppressing it so now we have more fuel build up and now we're addressing that right now. Um, we're, our focus is on um, working from communities and homes outwards. Greenhorn when they had the whole they had a big day of burning out there and they did lose one structure and it was simply too much fire too few resources they kind of could have or should have I mean some of the wildland guys toured it later and said we don't really understand why you didn't lose the whole valley I mean they, they were impressed with the fact that only one house had been lost and you know, there's there are changes that come from that on the more of the administrative level. You know, it's it's helped these um, the cities and the county to start to get, move away from these flammable roof structures and things like that. I mean, I guess that could go back to the the question after Castle Rock. You know, that was the start of the push for like, okay, you know, it's crazy to have wood shake roof and you know, <clears throat> it just doesn't make sense and shake siding and. Um, you know, needs to be a more flame re resistant. And there was a little bit more of that out Greenhorn than these guys were expecting. And so they were lucky to have some slightly more resistant structures to work with. Because fire's coming and how do we want it to approach our community? And um, what are we gonna do to make our communities more adaptable? And I think the Wood River Valley um, has been pretty proactive in that. And from these past fires, just the interest of wanting, to, of recognizing that we need to be able to adapt to it has been um, great. The easier you make it for somebody to steer it around your house, the better chance you have of it still being standing when they let you back in. Both fires were absolutely devastating to the local economy. You know, we're a resort economy. In the height of summer fire season, everybody's supposed to be riding their bikes and enjoying the backcountry. And instead they had to run for their lives. Uh, so many businesses shut down. The whole economic piece of it is that I felt that the government, you know, by not managing their property and their forest appropriately or, you know, once they knew that the fire was started, not giving us the resources, caused us, you know, uh, to suffer possibly $10 million of damage in the summer with nowhere for us to turn other than to suck it up. And I know that a lot of people had to close their doors and went out of business as a result. You know, the tourists leaving early in August, it was a really big hit um, for a lot of community businesses. At that point, once the smoke blew in, you know, our summer was over on both, during both events. How in the world can I throw what is essentially a cocktail party for 20,000 people while we have maybe 15,000 people risking their lives on that mountain. I just can't bring myself to doing it. And you know, and so I'm canceling it. That was a, that was a big decision. And that was probably outside of the decision to risk bankrupting the city of Ketchum while we waited for resources show up. Outside of the decision, you know, to try to keep our community safe by deciding which the evacuation areas. This wagon day decision was the one that, that I think really weighed on me the most because that was essentially, you know, throwing the white flag into the fire and, you know, saying, okay, you win.
We live in a really amazing community that really supports supports each other, but you don't, sometimes you take that for granted or you just don't realize it until there are crisis situations and people become so generous. Um, and so that, if any, if that's a benefit, I think that it really brings the community together and connects you with people that previously you might not be connected with. Sort of seminal events in the Valley. I mean, I think the flooding this year will be, you know, it's one of those things that people kind of, they track themselves by like, oh, were you here for Castle Rock? Were you here for Beaver Creek? And, um, you know, it's, it's part of living in the mountains. I love living in the mountains. I mean, I, it's not for this reason per se, but I find life a little bit more interesting when these things are going on. And I say that even when I'm not sure if my house is gonna flood yet this year. Um, you know, it's part, of, it's part of life in the mountains. Everywhere you drove, it seemed like there were people with signs, people bringing food, people cheering the hot shots and the crews as they were driving by. Just the appreciation and the support that we had um, being a Forest Service employee, I think we hear more grief than um, just frustration, people's frustration with the land management. Um, but during and after the Castle Rock fire, I just, people were waving and thank you and I, and then of course we had the concert afterwards and stuff, but I just, I hadn't felt that much appreciation. Both of the incident commanders for these type one teams, you know, whether, you know, it's Beth Lund or Jean Pinchatoli, you know, were women that made all the decisions to protect our way of life, not once, but twice within five years. And uh, the, the statement that that makes to the young women in our community, my daughter, you know, our kids and early, early ages, you know, who get to really understand at some point, maybe even through this, you know, exhibit that you're gonna do down there, you know, that it was because of the leadership of these two remarkable women saved our community. You know, we talk about all of like the flowers that are coming out and how beautiful it is, and that's definitely so. There are really positive things that come out of out of the fires as well. So it's easy to get kind of into the like scary part, and and when you feel like you know physically threatened by them, um, but it's good to be reminded that that there are good things that come out of it too, yeah. and that we just have to start getting used to change because I think that's going to become more constant than than it has in the past. So kind of adapting and being more flexible.